Okay, we're ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Atchison, and I am the president of the BC Construction Association, and I welcome uh, to this important uh, BCCA webinar. Today, we'll be delving into BCCA's recent industry alert on the removal of Contract A. I want to begin by acknowledging that we live and work throughout the many traditional and unceded territories covering all regions of British Columbia. And I speak to you this morning from the land of the Lekwungen speaking peoples known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. Um, last week, BCCA issued an industry alert as a service to members of the regional construction associations and to industry at large. In the opinion of BCCA, the removal of contract A is the most significant violation of public sector procurement processes that the construction industry has seen to date. We want to ensure that contractors are aware of the level of risk that they open themselves up to when they submit bids on projects where owners have removed Contract A from their procurement documents. The removal of Contract A and thus fairness impacts the entire supply chain from the general contractor to the electrician to the plumber, the painter and the flooring supplier and everyone else in between. All contractors have an expectation that their bids will be taken seriously and that they, their subcontractors and their competitors will be treated equally and fairly during the procurement process. A lack of fairness and greater risk to contractors will result in higher bids across the board and some good, capable trade and general contractors choosing to not bid at all. BCCA has engaged with a number of owners on this issue and we now have a duty to industry and our membership to help them understand the implications. Helping us to do that today is legal counsel for BCCA, Michael Demers. Mike has been practicing law for more than 30 years now, almost exclusively in the construction law area. He was a partner at two well-known and respected Vancouver law firms before setting off on his own in 2018. He has been and continues to be involved in many of the largest and most complex construction projects in British Columbia. And he has been legal counsel in a number of precedent setting court decisions, as well as counsel in a host of mediation and arbitrations. While typically acting for contractors and subcontractors, he is also counsel for a select group of owners, giving him the unique pers perspective of experiencing both sides of the fence. He is a fellow of the Canadian College of Construction Lawyers, recipient of the Best Lawyers in Canada Award, and a former director and vice chair of the Vancouver Regional Construction Association. Joining Mike today is Katie Fairley, industry practices consultant for BCCA and principal at Katie Fairley Strategies. The former vice president of a diversified general contractor and construction manager in Southern BC, Katie is an expert and an advisor on topics related to project delivery, construction contracts, and procurement best practices. Katie promotes and advocates for fair, open, and transparent construction practices and works with public and private owners to improve project delivery by defining strategies and risk mitigation for procurement and contract administration. Katie has served on the board of directors for multiple construction associations, including BCCA, and at local, provincial, and the national level as well. BCCA is fortunate to benefit from the ongoing counsel of both these experts. Thank you, Katie and Mike, for leading this webinar today. Our industry will benefit from your insights. As a reminder, before we begin, we encourage your questions in the chat, but please wait until our speakers have been given a chance to present and discuss before you ask a question that will likely be covered. For the interest of all, BCCA has also set up a tip line for anyone who wishes to signal a case of contract A uh, removal by a public owner. You can link access uh, to the tip line simply by clicking on the link available in the chat. And also know that this session will be recorded and all registered delegates will be receiving a link to that recording. So again, thank you all for being here. And now over to you, Katie and Mike. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so first off, um, I'm going to cover off kind of our agenda for today. Hopefully all of you have read the alert. Um, we're gonna put a link to that uh, into the chat um, so you'll be able to, to get that. Um, so we're gonna go through kind of why is this not just a general contractor problem? Um, we'll talk about the background briefly of what is contract A, 
We'll go through some of the examples so that you can see some of that, that language um, that's being used um, that you should be aware of. Um, also, what does it mean to remove contract A? Um, we're going to talk about the implications for industry, for those sub suppliers um, uh, and general contractors, as well as uh, our recommendations for how industry should proceed kind of in this unprecedented landscape that we're not uh, that we're faced with. So um, also, like Chris said, we are going to have a question period uh, where Mike will be on hand uh, and my and myself and Chris uh, to answer any questions. Um, we are going to be covering a lot of topics today. So like Chris said, some of the, your questions might get answered. Um, so just hold off putting them into the chat um, until we get a bit closer to the end um, of the presentation today. So for, for those of you on the line that think this is going to be an opportunity to talk about requests for proposals and whether or not they should be used on different delivery methods, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Um, uh, while we'll be touching on what that what RFPs and tenders mean to get some common language, um, we are here to talk about the removal of contract A from any type of procurement document. Um, we're here today, you know, like Chris said, we're talking about fairness and equality and making sure that everybody in the marketplace has the same kick at the can, so to speak. Um, well, I'll be doing most of the talking during the presentation. Um, I do have Mike here. He's going to jump in if needed with any kind of legal nuance to say, hey, Katie, you're wrong. Um, so Mike, just uh, please jump in and, uh, and interrupt me if I kind of uh, go off on, on something that you want to provide more input on. Will do. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, and our audience today is the suppliers, the subcontractors, and the general contractors. Um, I do know that we have a lot of owners on the line, um, but that's really our, our focus of this industry alert um, was to let industry know. And uh, with that, I'll head into our first topic about why this is an issue for the subcontractors and suppliers as well. So when an owner removes contract A, the bidding subcontractor is faced with the same risks that are described in our alert um, than you know, what would we traditionally think of a, as a general contractor problem that are you know, indirect contract with an owner. So this is not just an issue for general contractors. So just think of that impact all the way down the supply chain to the sub subs, to the suppliers, the lighting fixture suppliers, um, you know, an AHU, the painter, all the way down. So oftentimes, um, you know, in industry, I think we're all a little guilty of thinking of the general contractor and that relationship with the owner. But we want to make sure that everybody is aware that we're talking about everybody here. Um, and we're also this is an issue because uh, we also have our supporting uh, organizations. So we're seeing this type of language about the explicit removal of contract A uh, in uh, procurement documents that are uh, looking for services for architects and engineers and other types of, of service uh, professionals as well. So kind of one of the, the items to think about is uh, what about a consent of surety? If you're removing contract A, and we're gonna get into some of this, you know, what it sort of guarantee or binding nature that a subcontractor and a supplier, for them to know that there will in fact be an L&M, labor and material payment bond on the project. You know, are you certain that in a situation where contract A is removed and, you know, as a duty of fairness, a binding nature of the of the terms and conditions of the procurement, you know, do you know for certain that that's going to be there? Um, because that's the that's the nature of the removal of contract A. Is that going to be one of these innovations that could be removed uh, in order to save the bonding costs on a project? So why did we issue this alert? Why did CCA take this uh, extraordinary step the, the first time an industry alert has ever been issued? Um, and that's because it's no longer business as usual. So what we're seeing is a number of public sector owners. I want to emphasize not all, you know, most are not removing contract day. But some of these owners have started writing in language explicitly into a wide variety of procurement documents that are removing uh, terms that expressly avoid owners having to act fairly and also binding themselves to their own terms and conditions and also 
binding industry and those compliant bidders uh, into the, the, uh, the terms of the procurement process. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about our process of how we got to this step of, of uh, issuing an industry alert. So we had engaged um, for some time with a number of owners that we, we saw this kind of problematic language, this explicit removal of the term of contract A. Um, so we did engage with these, these government entities, but um, at a certain point we said, you know what, kind of these owners right now are kind of benefiting to a certain extent from the fact that industry doesn't know that the rules have changed. And in fact, you know, are there even rules? Um, so some of the, the process that we went through, uh, you know, Mike, you and I uh, and BCCA, we've talked about this issue um, kind of a number of times. Um, BCCA's board of directors was involved. We have an industry practices committee that removed uh, that reviewed multiple drafts um, of this alert. Um, we again had legal counsel review on a number of occasions, um, and then we also uh, circulated it to our supporting organizations as well as our national association, the Canadian Construction Association, for their comment. So there's a lot of due diligence involved. Um, we had in as we were going through this process, um, you know, members started to flag to us this language that they're seeing about the explicit removal of contract A. So we didn't come, BCCA uh, and its board of directors did not come to issuing this, this alert lightly. It came as a result of, kind of six months of due diligence and then you know, further discussions with owners before that and then during that time. So what is contract A? That, uh, that you've heard so much about now. So it's um, it came about through a court case called Ron Engineering. Um, I'm sure a lot of you on the line have heard about this, this term. Um, if you've taken any uh, law courses through your regional construction association, you know, you would have heard about this. Um, but you know, to understand its its implication and its impact is, is another thing, of course. So in Canadian contract law, contract A ensures fairness, openness, and transparency between the owner and each compliant bidder who submits to a procurement call. Contract A typically includes terms and conditions such as the deadline, evaluation criteria, privilege clauses, and often there is also a requirement for bid security. And it serves to protect the legitimate expectations and interests of all parties. Um, you know, I would continue to urge everybody, you can go into uh, the industry alert, you can read a lot more detail about what contract A is. Um, but I would kind of draw everyone's attention, um, you know, to that second point. How often do you see a procurement um, put out by an owner of any kind that has kind of deadlines, evaluation criteria, there's probably some privilege clauses. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide, um, as well as asking for some form of, of bid security, whether it's a bid bond, maybe they're even asking for some form of consent of surety. Um, there might be validity periods, that sort of thing, right? So we see that I would say in all uh, public sector for procurements. Yeah, Katie, I think it's probably worth just going back to that and, and to emphasize if we can. And just to emphasize the point that the the laws in Canada, the courts in Canada have used the concept of this of a contract, a bidding contract, to ensure that everybody knows what the rules of the procurement are and everybody follows the rules. And so that was the whole basis for establishing a system that actually works uh, for Canadian procurement and has worked well for you know fifty years, sixty years now. Absolutely. Um, so what is kind of contract A maybe versus contract B? I'm going to skip to the bottom because it's probably the most straightforward one. Uh, contract B, that's your, your signed contract. That's that's the, the construction contract. It's your CCDC contract. It's your MMCD. You know, it's it's what we traditionally, you know, would think of, of a contract. I will say, um, and I will say it a couple of times, um, you know, make sure you get a contract. Uh, make sure you read your contract. And then make sure you sign your contract. Um, then that you know that there I'm talking about the construction contract. So um, if anyone's ever read anything that BCCA talks about, that's one of our major pushes to to industry. Um, so, but what, let's take a step back from that 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 final step of a contract B. So what is contract A? Again, contract A exists with compliant bidders. 
That's that's an important aspect of it. There's also the express terms. Um, those are express terms that are explicitly stated in the procurement document. Uh, you know, the deadline of, of 2 p.m. to submit your uh, your bid or your submission. And then there's implied terms that are, you know, such things as, you know, fairness in the evaluation process, um, et cetera. So what has changed? What, are, what have we seen now uh, kind of give rise to this? So how is this happening, this removal of contract day? Well, it's where we're seeing procurement documents uh, that include language with expressly state that there are no contract A will ever come into an existence through the procurement process. So that's literally being written in. You don't have to really kind of search through, you know, what do they mean? It's it's what we're seeing it as explicitly stated. Um, so the actual language that we're seeing used between some of these owners, it does vary uh, slightly, but by and large, um, you know, we're, we're seeing none of the same language, um, you know, used amongst uh, a number of public sector owners. So if, if you're looking to search through your procurement documents, um, I would suggest, you know, you can put a quotation around. So contract A in quotations, um, and that should should turn it up. Um, but just be, uh, you know, because if you just put in contract A, you're going to get stuff like construction administration or, you know, contract administration, that'll turn up a whole slew of them, obviously, in procurement documents. So to give a couple of examples, this is probably the one that we've seen um, you know, the most often. So this is stating there's no contract day and no claims. Um, and highlighted there is, you know, this opportunity will not give rise to any contract A based tendering law duties, et cetera. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, probably what you could see uh, for those of you looking for these, this, this sort of language in there. And as we get to what the implications are, um, you know, for industry as well. The one that is maybe most interesting is uh, this next one that we've seen used a couple of times. So here we have uh, an owner stating um, that there's no formation of, of a contract by uh, by submitting kind of uh, an, an offer, um, that they're, they're removed contract A, and also there's no agreement of any kind, express or implied, including any contract A or implied terms, including any implied duty of fairness shall result from the submission of a proposal. So the owner right there, I mean, that's kind of nice. They're telling you exactly, um, you know, that there is no, that by removing contract A, there's no implied duty of fairness. So, um, you know, so let, let's keep that in mind. But let's go to the, the next. Katie, just while you've got, oh, okay. Yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm a little bit ahead of you. This this is where it gets interesting. Nevertheless, proposals submitted to the bidding system in relation of the formation of a performance contract, arguably you could say that's a contract B. It's a signed contract. Are offers capable of acceptance by the city, whether or not the proposal is non-compliant or includes exceptions or clarifications? So you're submitting something that's non-binding, but this owner has given themselves the opportunity to accept it. Um, but then, Mike, I'm sure you want to say something. Yeah, but then you'll notice, so it gives those two examples, but then goes on to say, but provided that the mandatory requirements are met. And so it seems to suggest that there is a rule that if you, if you haven't included all of the mandatory requirements, uh, the owner can't snap up or can't accept your offer. Right. And so is that a binding agreement that they can't accept an offer that doesn't include the mandatory requirements? And if it is, um, and they go ahead and do accept an offer that doesn't include the mandatory requirements, what do you as the other low bidder do uh, in relation to it? Nothing. You're, you're completely without uh, any legal recourse. Yeah. And and maybe I'll just say, you know, maybe maybe you're not the low bidder. Um, you know, I think you know, owners uh frequently write in discretionary and privilege clauses that that give them a lot of leeway. And I think I just I I want to be clear that we're not even necessarily talking about, you know, low bid or any bid scenario where except we're we're talking about kind of a submission into an owner. I think that's that's fair to say, Mike, as we go through this. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. But I think about like, what if the mandatory requirement was you have to include a hundred percent bid bond, right? And so you as a bidder um, get your surety, they issue you a bid bond, your, your um, guarantee is on the line in that, and your competition doesn't bother including a bid bond, right? And saves money as a result, has less risk as a result, et cetera. Um, this contract says that the uh, owner um, can go ahead and accept that, or sorry, can't accept the bid submitted by someone who didn't include the bid bond, right? That's the second, but provided that the mandatory requirements are met. But if it goes ahead and does it, you have no recourse to complain about it as the other uh, bidder who did go to the time and expense of including the bid bond. So it's a, it's a mess. Yeah, and I think, you know, those two examples, and and Mike, you did it, thank you for explaining that, is that's just it, is that this is, it's so murky, it's, you know, it's like, you know, nobody really knows the implications of this, right? Um, and I, I think the other thing to keep in mind as we talk about um, kind of fairness, um, you know, an implied duty of fairness, is that you know, my understanding, Mike, has always been that if if an owner says must in their procurement documents, that's also applicable to themselves. Kind yes. of, it's a it's a two way street. Yeah, generally that's exactly correct. Yeah, it's kind of uh, uh, the rules of the game, so to speak. So, to our contractors, you know, what does this mean? Um, so, uh, you know, I'll say it says right there. I've underlined it so everyone can see it. Firms choosing to submit and do business with these owners. I think, you know, always remember that you're, uh, you know, quote unquote, sophisticated business entities. You have the choice as to whether or not, um, you know, you submit on a procurement, you sign a contract to to that extent. You know, you, you are in control, um, you know, as you make these business decisions. So this is entirely your decision. Our process today, our, our, the reason we issued this alert is around kind of identifying these, these risks um, and then it's up to your choice uh, whether to to continue to do business. Um, so there is uh, first one kind of no fairness. They don't have an obligation to treat bidders fairly or consistently. Could they share your submission price? Maybe your your pre-construction fees? Could they share those amongst other bidders and and maybe try to get the best offer? Um, you know, could they share? Uh, your name subcontractors with another bidder and say, you know, they named ABC Contracting, uh, you know, we would like to, to name them as well. Um, you know, we just don't know. There's there's, there's no more fairness in that process. There's really um, no rules, as number four says. So there's a bias. Um, you know, these owners could award contracts based on unstated and secret preferences. Um, you know, so maybe there's, it's just, again, not stated in the, in the documents. Maybe, uh, you know, this is their, their buddy down the street. Um, who knows? Um, but that's, that's the implication of, um, of removing this, this contract A explicitly from documents. Also bid shopping. Like I mentioned before, those owners, they could now disclose your bid, uh, to people who either maybe even didn't bid in the first place, right? There's, there's no rules. There's no, no duty of fairness now. Um, now, and then I'll, I'll preface this. And again, I know we got a lot of owners on the line. I am not suggesting, and I think it's fair to say BCCA is not suggesting that in any way, this is your intent. However, this is the implication of it. Um, you know, and, and again, like we're raising these questions, uh, you know, to industry, so they can also start to, to think about this. And again, you know, we just talked about it. What are the rules? Uh, there aren't any enforceable rules. Um, I think that opens that that door, um, you know, Mike, uh, you know, does the the must that an owner has written in, is that a must now? Uh, do they have to follow their own musts and shalls? Uh, do the bidders? Um, it, it opens up a Pandora's uh, box. And I think another uh, item for, you know, our contractors on the line, you know, you could be prejudiced for doing the right thing, you know, for submitting online on time at 2 p.m., um, you know, where maybe somebody else kind of waits to see what else might roll in and they're submitting at, you know, 405. 
um, you know, perhaps you know that's the implication of this. Yeah, that's that's an interesting example, Katie, because you can see, and, and it gets back to your first point or an earlier point, you can see a situation happening where um, your your some people's bid is in at at two o'clock as as per the request. Um, bids are opened. Everybody knows what the low bid is. Um, my brother-in-law, I'm running the procurement. My brother-in-law comes in and says, okay, I'm going to submit a bid at four o'clock after the bids are opened, and I'm going to be $100,000 lower than your low bid. Right? The, the temptation might be on the part of the owner. Well, that's a $100,000 saving for our taxpayer. It's a good rationale for me to accept my brother-in-law's bid. And just happened that I told him where he had to be if he wanted to get that job. Um, and and I agree with you, Katie. Uh, surely that's not the intention of public owners. Uh, we should expect more from professionals who are involved in the procurement process. The reality is, it has happened throughout history, continues to happen, that those situations occur. And that's why contract day came into existence. And it's it's what the courts have used to make sure that that potential abuse isn't manifesting itself in the actual procurement process that we're seeing. Yeah, and I, I think I don't want to lose track of kind of these other um, delivery methods that are out there, whether it's construction management, construction management, converting to a stipulated sum, whether it's, you know, design build kind of, I don't want to lose track of those other delivery methods with this, um, because I think that this very much applies to procurements that are procuring a project using those other delivery methods. Does that mean that that somebody gets gets word that, oh, actually on this CM proposal submission, um, you know, we need to actually, we need to fix up, you know, who, who we named as the project manager. Okay, now we can submit them the next day um, because we think now we're gonna, we're gonna be able to score better because we, we've heard something that maybe they didn't love uh, the experience of our super or our PM. Um, you know, again, same thing with kind of this idea of bid shopping. Does that mean that your percentage fee for, for a CM project um, or, you know, maybe some of the price breakdowns on a design build, does that not mean that they can be shopped? We just, we don't know. I don't want to lose track, you know, that that we're not just talking about kind of our traditional design bid build tendering process that this, you know, can very much, could very much impact um, kind of all forms of of procurement as we go through this. So maybe uh, as I just preface this, so is this just about tenders or is it an RFP? Um, I think that this is an important kind of terminology uh, to get to get right. Um, so we're going to kind of make sure that we're we're defining it correctly. Um, and I'll just put an asterisk on all of this, you know, about, you know, what about request for qualifications? We are seeing this explicit removal of contract A, um, you know, in request for qualifications um, as well. Kind of in, in our point, I think, Mike, you know, you said this to me, why even say it in the documents when you have privilege and discretionary clauses that can make it very clear as to the owner's intent of issuing a request for qualifications? So, I just want to I want to park that idea, but you know that's kind of one of those aspects of a, of an RFQ process. Why even put it in there? Yeah, but I also told you, Katie, I didn't think it arose in a request for quality yeah. scenario anyway. So exactly <laughs> making it redundant. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. You know, it's um, it doesn't even arise. So why say it other than maybe to give a red flag about removing fairness? I don't I don't know. Who knows? I don't think I know, but. Um, so again, anybody who's uh, kind of attended a construction law course has probably heard this one. You know, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it is probably a duck. So um, I think you know what I've I've heard construction lawyers, and it, you know, it's it's a litmus test. Um, you know, you can call it an RFP, you could call it a tender, you can call it an RF quote. Um, you know, any of these things, if it has a certain number of hallmarks. Um, then the courts look at it as, as a tender. So it, are there binding obligations? Are there defined terms and conditions? Are there evaluation criteria? Is there an intent to enter into a contract? Um, I will put it to all of you that for, you know, I'm sure everybody here has 
responded to hundreds, if not thousands of, of government procurement uh, calls. I bet you that that's the feeling that, or that what you explicitly see in just about every single one. Um, so kind of what, what are we talking about here today? Um, it looks and it swims and it quacks like a duck, but it's actually a goose that has had plastic surgery. So, you know, what if it is a goose? What if some of those hallmarks um, you know, that we would look at as kind of traditional government procurement, um, you know, aren't there. But at the same time, let's say there's a solution is in place. That's kind of, you know, one of those hallmarks of what is a, a true RFP. There's a solution in place. There are specs and drawings. Maybe the services are defined. Um, you know, the, the owner knows what they want from their construction manager, Um you know, they they have the design build uh, owners requirements laid out um, the evaluation criteria. It's it's weighted. Um, maybe instead of giving bid security, uh, a bid bond, maybe they're looking for a consent of surety. And I know we've got folks from the surety association on today, and I know this is a major concern of theirs. Um, it likely has some form of validity or maybe they've even gone so far as to remove that um so you know it maybe it's not a duck but this goose is awfully problematic um and that's where we're kind of seeing i think a marrying of sorts you know kind of of these two uh these two items So um, uh, just for the the contractors on the line, you know, what are we hearing from owners? Like, and and I'll say, you know, this is some of what we've heard over the last uh, year as we've engaged with owners on this topic. Um, so this is kind of some of the following uh, myths that we've heard about. Um, we will be forced to award the project if we don't remove contract day. What happens if we're over budget? Um, there are a lot of uh, examples, I'm sure we've all read them, about the use of discretionary clauses and privilege clauses that owners can use. Uh, you could have the owner say, the owner reserves the right not to accept the lowest bid or any bid. Uh, the owner reserves the right to cancel this process at any time. Um, you know, there's there's lots of language in there that, um, that can protect an owner without removing contract A. And most importantly, telling the market, you know, what their intent is. Right, you know, let the market make the decision if they're um, kind of okay with your with your rules of uh, of engagement. Um, next one: public entities in BC and the rest of Canada are moving uh, this way to ensure the public gets quality and value for taxpayers' dollars. And Mike, you know, you already touched on kind of this idea of what is what is value. Um, you know, in reviewing uh, public sector documents over the well the last 15 years I've been in industry, um, you know, I, we know that the uh, infrastructure BC led procurements, um, they don't remove contract A. So we're talking about, you know, the largest uh, government funded projects uh, in the province are delivered under, um, you know, with contract A intact, you know, they're not explicitly removing it. So, you know, um, it's not all public entities. It's, uh, you know, it is, I would say, a problematic number and a growing number, but um, but no, there are many owners believe that using contract A, you know, is fair um, and they are looking for binding submissions um, regardless of the of the delivery method. Um, I'm kind of pausing here, Mike, in case you ever want to jump in. Um, You're doing but great. I'll, okay, excellent. Um, and then the another one is, um, this allows us to assess their input and deal with any design changes that may be required before contract award to ensure the owner receives the best project delivery from the awarded contractor. Um, I, I think that's misguided um, at best. So there are a lot of tools in an owner's tool belt to deliver a project. Um, you know, those are project delivery methods. So I've listed them off before. It's, you know, there's three forms of construction management, whether it's kind of pure construction management or, uh, you know, CM class plus, CM converting to a stipulated price. There's design build, there's progressive design build. There, there's, a, there's 
a lot of delivery methods out there that um, that can engage a contractor early uh, to really maximize um, their expertise during the design process. Um, so an, another benefit of using those other delivery methods, there's also a high degree of transparency into the trade pricing, right? Like let's again, you know, this this impacts the entire supply chain. It's not just, you know, this, this one prime contract, um, you know, uh, before them. So, you know, all of these, these kind of three big myths that I've thrown up there, all of these are completely achievable and possible without removing contract day, without removing um, a duty uh, of fairness. Yes. Let, let, Kate, I just want to speak to the last, the last of those three points. Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, and I, I appreciate people have different opinions and different perspectives. From my perspective, the idea that an owner wants to to get value from a contractor or from bidders as to uh, constructability or or value add and and things like that before the contract is awarded i get it it's a great idea you know that's a it's a great resource for owners to tap into um and that's what a traditional rfp has been used for right and and i don't think katie bcca is saying that's that's awful. We shouldn't be using traditional RFPs with the removal of contract A. But in something like you've got a fully designed school uh, with drawings and specs and a schedule and what the owner's looking for is, okay, what's it going to cost to have this box built? Um, that's really just a competition uh, over who can do it for the best value, right? And it's it's those situations that contract day should be in place to protect the the expectations of the parties because if if you know that you're going to be evaluated on price or on value to talk about that nuanced view that katie talked about you're going to make sure you sharpen your pencil and make sure that the price you give is the best one because you know you're competing with all these different people but if there is no contract day and it's a wide open competition you may choose not to go in with your best price in the first instance until you see who else is who else is bidding, where their prices are at. You might want to qualify it to say, uh, okay, I'll do this part of the school, but I won't do the field. I'll do the building, but I'm not going to do the field. And and so the people who are involved from the owner side of assessing the procurement, you may get 20 different uh ideas and, and breakdowns of who's bidding what for what prices. And it makes it really difficult to figure out who's going to give you the best value and what kind of a procurement process or what kind of a procurement model you're going to get stuck with at the end of the day. Are you going to have to have multiple contractors doing various different things? So it's it, it's it's asking for trouble. Really yeah, and I, yeah, and I think we could look at that from a from a contract perspective as well. As you know, one contractor goes, you know, I'm submitting my bid, but I I'm not accepting any of your supplementary conditions. Um, you know, it it I think you're right. It opens it opens the door, and I think there's again like there's a lot of other tools in a project delivery toolbox that can achieve just that. Um, you know, and and get folks involved uh, early without again without having to remove contract day. Um, so, um, so the, you know, we've talked about how the removal of contract A results in some significant issues, and and there is, you know, currently uh, little legal precedent to kind of offer guidance the way, um, you know, that we have had in other situations about, uh, you know, raw engineering. So, for example, uh, removing contract A could mean um, submissions can be withdrawn at any time. Uh, submissions can be changed at any time. And for some of uh, you contractors and probably more sub subcontractors and suppliers, you might think that's pretty good. Um, I'm not going to lie. Maybe some of you think that's this is this is OK. Let's play this game. Yeah, Mike. But, but that's that's where it gets difficult or tricky. Totally. You're, you're a GC and, and you think your subs have to hold their prices and they're not and they don't have to. You're going to get squeezed if the owner accepts your bid. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think the, the point of all of this is to talk about how complicated this is. And we're, we're going to go into the recommendations on the next um, on the next slide as well. Um, 
I actually, I just, I'll stop and, and give an example of what happened. So I'm um, actually on a, on a RFP um, that one of the examples that we talked about earlier, um, a subcontractor submitted their price to a general contractor who in turn submitted a proposal to this owner. Um, and this subcontractor was named, they were named in the submission, um, you know, on a form. Um, and then from there, they engaged in, in a, in a level of kind of, uh, value engineering, um, you know, kind of innovation giving, um, to this contractor and therefore the owner as well. Um, you know, they gave all their good ideas of how to get the, the number down, how to make this work. In the end, that general contractor carried, um, another subcon or another sub for that scope of work. Is there recourse for that, for that subcontractor? I mean, that's, that's a question there. It hasn't, it hasn't been answered. Um, you know, I think that that sub was dealing in good faith, um, you know, but, but there was nothing there to, to hold them to the fact that they were, that they were named. Um, so submissions can be qualified resulting in an apples versus oranges versus peach scenario. And Mike, you just talked about that. Um, there may be no obligation on the trade contractors or suppliers to keep their pr price firm. Um, and there may be no binding bid security. And uh, I know we might have some folks on the line again, kind of like one and two, maybe that sounds, that sounds okay. Um, but again, I mean, it, does that mean that there's no consent of surety? Does that mean there's an obligation then to not provide a performance in a labor material payment bond? I mean, that's, that's some of the implications of this, right? Um, and then the underlying construction contract terms are open for negotiation so that all bidders could be bidding on different terms and conditions for a different scope of work. Um, and I would kind of put to everybody here, um, how often does the do government owners negotiate on the big three risk provisions? So insurance, indemnification, contract security, those are, are largely speaking kind of quote unquote untouchable. Um, some folks might say, yeah, okay, well, sometimes we've been able to negotiate something different, but I'm telling you generally, um, those supplementary conditions uh, are, are really, let's be honest, they're, they are immovable. Um, you know, so so why why pretend there's a negotiation? That's my own opinion. So our recommendations for industries, uh, you know, ask yourself if you want to pursue and bid on a project with an owner who starts a project by removing an obligation to act fairly and with integrity with its dealings with you and your competitors. Right. And again, and we, everybody wants the same kick at the can. Um, so read all procurement documents carefully. Uh, do not assume that they are the same as you as you previously saw from that owner. And this is, um, you know, I put this in here because of the rise of CCDC2 2020. Um, you know, we have seen a shift both in supplementary conditions, but also tender documents. And we know that this clause is coming in more and more. So don't just assume they're the same. And then also understand the intent and consequences of the procurement and contract terms. Uh, use the RFI process during procurement to question the intent of the owner's procurement process. If you have a, a request for qualifications that's removing contract A, RFI the question. Um, you know, RFI, you know, why are they removing that? I, I highly doubt their intent is to remove fairness. Who knows? Uh, contact BCCA and your regional construction association to signal a case of contract A removal uh, by using our tip line. And I would say it's not just about contract A. We have seen a kind of a decline of what kind of the traditional norms and, and values of, of procurement um, for construction services. So we do have a number of other options. You know, if you're not getting bid results, if you're not getting your debrief, uh, you're not getting a site visit list, um, you can also use that. Um, consider qualifying your bid as long as you know the risks associated with doing that and are prepared to accept the consequences. Uh, perhaps an owner takes the view that it was binding or that you were supposed to accept those terms or you say we don't like your markups for change orders um and they and they may choose to reject you for the for that so again you know you're a business you know, make that business decision that you deem best um for your company 
Um, consult an experienced construction lawyer. Uh, I would say emphasis on the construction uh, part of that sentence. And also talk to your um, your surety and your broker when you see this sort of language. Or I would say actually just sorry, any any procurement that you're going after, you know, have them take a look at it. Um, you know, because they're also uh, important risk advisors. And maybe just quickly back on number three. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable RFIing that you know, reach out to your regional construction association uh, or Chris or myself, and, and we can ask that question of the owner um, because that's that impacts every bidder, right? That's that those this sort of language isn't just impacting you, it impacts everybody. So, um, you know, we can certainly uh, RFI that uh, on your behalf uh, to the owner. So um, just our closing thoughts, and then we've got uh, time for questions. So folks, if you have a question, uh, please put them in the chat box, uh, or sorry, rather the Q&A box, um, and just identify if you are a, a GC or a trade or a supplier or an owner or consultant uh, allied service provider. Um, so the issue overview, some public sector owners are removing contract day clauses from procurement documents that have ensured fairness and transparency since 1981. The impact on contractors is that without contract A, there is no obligation for an owner to treat bidders fairly or equally, increasing the risks of bias and bid shopping. And there's also some legal and practical concerns. The removal of contract A results in the lack of enforceable rules, uh, allowing submissions to be changed and withdrawn at any time and potentially leaving, leave, uh, leading to an apples versus orange uh, comparison. And for those of you that are going after public sector work, you don't want to be the peach in that scenario, right? Um, so, and finally, as always, read the procurement documents, read your contract, and remember that you're in control as you go into uh, each of these um, public sector for procurements. So we'll hand it over for questions. Uh, we've got them uh, coming in right now. So one of the questions, uh, this person didn't identify themselves, aren't these owners breaking the procurement, the public procurement policies? Are they aware of what they're doing? Um, I'll, maybe I'll let Mike speak a, a little bit to the first part about uh, breaking public procurement policies um, to the, are they aware of what they're doing? Um, they certainly are now, I guess. Now <laughs> we've, we've issued this industry alert. Um, uh, BCCA hosts uh, what we call owners only uh, educational webinars. Uh, Mike is a, a twice time um, uh, speaker. Um, and we've spoken, we've had speakers talk about the dangers of removing contract day for public sector owners. We've had them speak to it three times. So, um, you know, I think, you know, we've, we've raised the red flag, uh, BCCA and our regional construction association partners on a number of occasions. Um, I can speak a little bit to this concept of breaking public procurement policies. I don't know, uh, Mike, if you have anything to add there. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody's formally challenged it yet. What the public owners will say is, well, we're still being open. We're being transparent. We're being fair doesn't mean anybody can enforce it if we're not, but it's open to anybody. They can put in whatever pricing, whatever schedule, whatever they want. How much more open can we be? So I, I think that will be the approach by the um, owners who are going this route. And frankly, uh, I don't think there's an effective enforcement method uh, to, to challenge them on it. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree. I think um, from the municipal side, you know, uh, uh, you know, we looked at the, the trade agreements. Um, the provincial government has the capital asset management framework as well as um, CPPM. Um, but yeah, there's strictly speaking, there's kind of there's no hard and fast rules. Right. So um, so what we, what we need to do is continue to educate uh, industry and where we can owners um, you know, around these these what are best practices. Yeah. Do you want to start at the first question, Katie, or are you just going through randomly? Uh, no, I wanted to address that one, but we can okay. go to the first one. Um, so can Mike comment on whether the recent Supreme Court decision in Hassin versus Friday new might uh, impose obligation of good faith on owners in any event? 
Yeah, so uh, Basson was a case in the Supreme Court of Canada that talked about the essentially the implied duty of honest dealings between people involved in a contractual relationship. And it's a really good question because the these owners are making sure that there is no contract. And so in the absence of a contract, there aren't there isn't this question of a of a duty of honest performance of that contract even arising. So that whole line of authority and, and what the Supreme Court of Canada was concerned about there just can never arise because of th this position being taken by these owners. Okay. And um, I want to lead into another question that was asked. Um, if there is no contract A, then this applies both ways. How can an owner pull a bid bond then? And likewise, is collusion then legal in the absence of contract A? Yeah, it's so, a good question. It's, it's a good a question, question, Mike. No, no, it's I a, love it. it. It's a fantastic question. And and so I should, before we go any further, I should probably say I'm not giving anybody legal advice. Um, I'm expressing thoughts and information, but nobody should be relying on anything I say. Oh, likewise. Um, yeah, no, that's exactly right. This really, you know, another way to open or look at it, and Katie, you alluded to this in, in, in your pitch. Another way to look at it is this is open season for contractors. You know, if you want to take advantage of owners, it's never been a better time, uh, at least since 1981, to be able to do that. Um, getting together with other bidders. Um, I'm not suggesting you should, and I'm not advising you either way, but it, it opens up owners to significant procurement risks that they don't have uh, in a traditional contract day scenario. And I just want to touch on that. One of the examples that we gave uh, when you go through the rest of that kind of template procurement document that, that this is where we're seeing it the most uh, often. The owner says there is you, you can't collude with your competitors. They they go into a lot of detail about what uh, what collusion is. I guess, you know, I view that as something that's binding. So then if it's binding, doesn't that give rise to contract A? I mean, it's an interesting <laughs> It's a circular argument. It's 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 wild stuff, and again, that's why we need to flag it to to everybody. Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty nuts. Yeah. Um. All right. Another another really great question. How is this any different from a strongly written privilege clause where the owners can basically do whatever they want, anyways? At least in this situation, the owner is being very clear about the rules, and bidders can decide to bid or not. Coming from a consultant who's worked on all sides, I'd say absolutely that's it. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, let the market make the informed decision. If they don't like what you've written into your, an owner's written into their tender documents, you know, let them make the informed decision. Because um, I, I don't know how many contractors are going to are gonna bid if they see written in there, we're going to bid shop. Um, you know, they're, they're not going to, uh, look favorably, but you're, you're not wrong. Um, you know, but at least in the situation of writing in really strong privilege clauses, I'm going to repeat back what you said, cause it, it is really good. Um, at least in that situation where there are really strong privilege and discretionary clauses, the market will know. Yeah. And, and the person doing the procurement at least says, well, I told them that I wouldn't do this. Right. And so there is a contract. A. They may not be able to sue me, but I still have the risk that somebody might get around this. I might I might be faced with a judge who's going to figure out a way around this um, privilege clause or, or waiver of liability or limitation of liability clause. And so I better be darn sure I'm I'm doing the right thing. Look, at this isn't rocket science, folks. It's it's uh, all we're saying is treat people fairly, treat people how you want to be treated. Right? That's what this is all about. Um, to say we want to make sure that we have the option of not having to do that. That's personally what I find offensive, but I don't mean to speak for, for industry. Uh, Katie, there was a question about administrative law remedies. Yeah. So um, I'm guessing that was written by a lawyer. So the question is this. There was no mention of all other laws that public entities must follow. Have you considered how administrative law mandates strict adherence to process procedural rules, especially concerning deadlines for bid submissions and other fairness matters. Uh, the principles of following these rules ensures fairness and fairness and transparency in processes like bidding for contracts. Um, it doesn't. So 
I've, I've seen this argument before. So when they're talking about administrative law remedies, um, there's this whole concept of a judicial review where, where uh, decisions taken by statutory bodies can be reviewed uh, by courts for, for fairness, procedural or substantive. And it gets really complicated. The, the problem is we've got case law in Canada that uh, spring, uh, is it Supreme Court, at least Federal Court of Appeal, that says it doesn't apply at all. Uh, this, this public law in a private law situation doesn't apply at all to subcontractors on procurement. We've got conflicting federal court decisions as to whether it applies in essentially a, a general contractor situation. We've got a trial court that says or that said it did, and then the federal court of appeal says it doesn't, at least in the traditional sense, and basically then goes on to discuss how this is all dealt with in, in, in contract A situations. That's how that's all dealt with. It's it's not dealt with by way of administrative remedies. And the other thing is the the remedies that are available to to somebody who's on the receiving end of unfair treatment uh, is not damages. So it's it's a real it's it's not a it's not an effective way under Canadian law to deal with the concerns of, of aggrieved bidders. So um, and we are getting tight on on time, and oh, you know we can we can see the questions here. If, if you're asking these uh, a lot of these questions, um, that that's exactly the reason why we're raising this issue because it is murky, it is unclear about the implications of it. But um, before I hand it back over to Chris, um, I'll just want to kind of read off one that I think summarizes kind of our session here today. You have stated that there are no rules, yet my experience with documents. Uh, uh, in that the rules are written into their documents, i.e. submissions can be withdrawn or changed until closing time. Are you stating that by removing contract A, owners don't have to abide by the procurements, the rules set out in their own documents? And I, I would say that that's really exactly what we're saying. But we're we're saying that, you know, also, we don't know. If you have rules, isn't that binding if you're saying, you know, um, you know, you uh, again, you know, you have to submit by such and such time, you know, maybe there's a couple of mandatory requirements, even if you remove all mandatory requirements, we are starting to see this doubling down from from some owners of continuously trying to find a more perfect way, uh, you know, to to make it what is ultimately a, a pure RFP, but somehow have complete design documents. No, Mike, if you have anything to add on that, but you know, um, yeah, is that what we're stating that by removing contract A, owners don't have to abide by the rules of their own procurements? E effectively, that's in a practical sense, that's where we're at. So, um, so I guess, Mike, <laughs> if there's anything else, I'll hand it, it to you to kind of give us some closing thoughts on all this. Um, well, can I just deal with two two comments? Absolutely. Or, or two yep. Q and A's. I I just uh, we've got something from Mike Atkinson and and. Probably nobody is more familiar with the construction industry and legal issues in the construction industry yeah. than Mike Atkinson. And he made the same comment about, about Basson is this fundamental concept that the Supreme Court of Canada talked about, about honest, fair dealings amongst parties to a contract is out the window in light of, of how some of these owners have, have dealt with it. Um, and then the other comment that I think is worth bearing is or talking about is uh, non-contract uh, a methods have been used in Canada for decades and other countries operate extensively outside of contract A, setting numerous precedents. It's not a legal requirement, blah, blah, blah. One of the fundamental differences is most of those, if not all of those other jurisdictions, whether you're talking about the UK, the European Union countries, the states, all have legislated. Yeah. Uh, procurement rules and practices that must be followed. So the government says, here is the law, thou shalt follow it. You don't need a contract day in that situation yeah. because all of that legislation sets out what happens. We're unique. If, 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 if we want the feds or the province to come in and set up a set of rules, um, that's a whole nother discussion that I don't want to be part of. <laughs> but um, two, two important points I think worth, worth mentioning and then I'm, I'm shutting up.
Thank you so much, Mike. And um, yeah, thank you all for joining. I know we have a, a, a lot of questions. Um, if you want to write in your name um, underneath so that, you know, we can reply back directly to you, um, you know, please, uh, please do that now. We do have a, a record of the questions. Uh, we can review those and, and we'll make a determination of if it's necessary to send out kind of the answer answers as best we can um, to those. So thank you all. Uh, thanks, Katie, and, and thank you, Mike. And uh, again, thanks to, to everyone for attending today and for your questions. Uh, I, I, I did get a chuckle out of the one question that said, you know, um, about tr transparency, how come we can't see the questions? We will share uh, our, our responses to all the questions, but, but fair game. Uh, there was no intent to hide any of the questions. And I think uh, Katie and Mike did a wonderful job of responding to the, um, you know, the ones where they could uh, at least tease out answers for for things that that either hadn't been ad addressed in their presentation, but there is more work to be done. There's more education to be done on all sides of this, and we appreciate this is just one week into the industry alert, and uh, really applaud the interest on all sides for us uh, bringing bringing some light and trying to imagine a better future, a more stable future for the industry and all stakeholders. Um, so there's a lot to consider here. We appreciate uh, Mike and Katie, you both leaning in to spell out and discuss the important implications and concerns for industry. I do trust that everyone listening today has gained from the webinar from greater awareness, information sharing, risk mitigation solutions, but no legal advice, all in the name of safeguarding and the best interests of the industry. A recording of this webinar will be made available to you shortly, so keep an eye in, uh, open in your inbox for that. Uh, and you will also uh, find a link to the recording in the uh, priority section of the BCCA website at bccaassn.com. Easy for me to say. Um, and, and if one thing is apparent, it's maintaining contract A is an important priority for our industry to uphold and to make it an advocacy issue for our industry. And we're encouraged by the conversations that we're having with some public owners and we hope that initiatives such as these will continue to educate everyone on the importance of maintaining fair, open, and transparent procurement practices. Please continue to stay engaged with us, uh, with the regional construction associations on this, on prompt payment and other industry serving topics. We're in your corner on this and other important issues. Thank you again so much for your time this morning and enjoy the rest of your day. All the best. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.